That's pretty good. Okay. Sounds good. I always do this. I always pull up the chat window and then I go to share my screen and the chat window goes away. Re pull up the chat window. Okay. There's only one deadline coming up, but it's the, it's the deadline of all deadlines, <laughs> especially if you're a graduating senior. <laughs> so, okay. Um, where are we? We're talking about, so, uh, any questions on the project, first of all, while we're, before we get into the prologue? So the shadowing, um, and adding the function expressions. And yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of say it again, the, the shadowing example, uh, the hard part I think is, you know, the, the, the actual code change you make is very small. It's like, you know, on the order of three or four or five words. But understanding, hey, I want to, I have an expression and usually we say, hey, my answer is gonna be made up of the subfields, the sub expressions entirely transform, say substitute. And that was the classic design recipe. And now we're sort of being a little bit more subtle, talk about, hey, substitute free variables. And so, yeah, it's like, hey, I may or may not want to recur on some of the subfields, depending on exactly uh, the statement I'm hitting. And I guess one observation I had from uh, one student in office hours um, was, and I can see sort of why people would think this uh, in retrospect. Uh, it's like saying, hey, I'm going to go ahead and there was one line of substitute in the previous homework that really did the work. That's when you got down to a single identifier. Hey, go ahead and is this the identifier I'm looking for? Uh, no, these are not the droids you're looking for. Do nothing. Or it is and, and do the substitution. Um, at that point, it's kind of you're like, hey, well, here's a, I'm at a variable X, is it a free variable or not? And you can't really tell at that point, you've lost the context. It was, you know, in some previous recursive call above you, you know, something. So, uh, and so your instinct might say, yeah, I need to go there. Then I need to somehow go back up the tree or something like that. Um, but we don't want to do that. I think it ends up being bitter, better to say, hey, back when you have some expression where you do have all the information, you simply decide, do I want to recur on this sub branch or not? Okay, I'm trying, trying to replace all the free occurrences of Z. Hey, um, if I have a, a let, you know, if I have, usually if I have a, a bin up, hey, what are the free occurrences in the entire bin up? Well, it's all the free occurrences on the left and all the free occurrences on the right. And the op itself is never a variable, so it's not gonna be a free, don't need to recur on that or even check it. Um, and if I have a let expression, um, and I'm trying to replace all the free occurrences of Z, well, if I have a, a let expression involving, hey, let X be something, well, find all the free occurrences in each of the subparts, just like usual. But and here's the one, the one thing. Um, if you're reaching a statement that says, hey, let Z be something, let B be some big expression in the body, Okay, if you have that, uh, so, so sorry, more like let Z be some expression in the body of the let. Uh, yeah, there might be free occurrences of Z up here, but there will be no free occurrences of Z down here. Why? Because if there was something that looked like a free occurrence of Z, it would be uh, referring to the Z that you're let. So it might be free in here, but it's not free inside the let. And your job was to replace any free occurrence inside the let you know that none of those will be free down here. And again, I think just one warning when you say a variable is free or bound, you have to say within what context, okay? It's not just a variable is free or variables bound. Um, hopefully the level of your top level main program, no variable is free. That would be an error if you had a, a free variable. But within a little sub expression, hey, I might have a free occurrence in here that is, you know, if I look inside the body of a function, yeah, num students might be a free variable. But hey, it was one of my parameters. When I look at it in the context of the entire function, it's, it wasn't free there. So, anyway, 
I've either totally given away the answer or totally muddled it for you. Um, that those are the odds you take when you have a borrowing class, right? Okay. Um, we are looking at prologue and uh, different relations. Close off these things here. And I think we uh, came up with last time, we said, hey, what is a father? And you know, this is sort of, this line is almost a poster child for what is the definition of a father is a parent who's male, okay? Again, we're giving the definition of what does it mean to be a father? And it, rather than anything like, hey, set a variable or loop over this or anything like that, it's just sort of declarative programming. What does it mean to be a father? Give me that, give it to me in a formal way and I'll actually run it for you. It's a very different way of thinking about problems. Um, a grandparent. Uh, so we had a couple of things here. We had things like, hey, uh, father that takes in two parameters and returns true or false. Is one person the father of another? And then just is one person a father? And we said, oh, either a father, if they're a father of anybody, can you solve for X to make that true? And we saw that, oh, prologue sort of sees when it sees X that you only use once and never use it anywhere else. It sort of says, hey, well, that was kind of pointless naming that. Let's call it underscore um, as a convention. Okay. Uh, grandparent, I think we, we have this grandparent rule. And this is an example where the right-hand side contains a variable that was not on the left-hand side. That's nothing unusual about that, but just be aware that it, it's fine if, if that happens. Old is the grandparent of young. If you can solve for uh, old, middle, and young such that uh, old is the parent of middle and middle is the parent of young. So maybe middle is a weird word. I should say middle age, midlife crisis. I don't know. Okay. Uh, and then we went with ancestor. Uh, when is one person an ancestor of another? And our main recursive rule here that we ended up with uh, is saying, hey, is old the ancestor of young? Well, if old is the parent of somebody X and X is the ancestor of young, then certainly old would be the ancestor of, of young. Okay, so ancestor of old young, if parent of old X and ancestor of X young. Okay, well, how do we know if X is the ancestor of young? Well, if there's some other child that, you know, if, if X is the parent of somebody and, uh, that person is an ancestor of young, then that would be true. And you seeing sort of, if you think about the recursion on rolling, you think about that getting closer and closer in the in instance where it's true. And our first base case we had was uh, an ancestor was, uh, X was an ancestor of Y, if X was a parent of Y. We sort of said that was our base case. And then Barla comes up and sort of says, you know, I think in a lot of settings, uh, a generalized ancestor to a computer scientist an ancestor is uh, everybody's their own ancestor trivially. Why you can get ancestors like, how, hey, how many generations link this person to that person? Okay, is there some set of path of parents that will get me from here to here? And I can say, hey, is, is there a path that gets me from some place to where I am? Sure, there's a path of zero steps. So not so much useful, useful in English conversation, maybe, but uh, useful as a unifying concept in in computer science. Hey, is there a path between somewhere? A nice simple base case feels cleaner. So, okay, and we tried this. We ran a bunch of uh, queries and got a bunch of answers. So, okay, uh, let's go ahead. Just for practice, I'll give you a couple seconds. Go ahead and see if you can write the function siblings. So again, siblings slash two means take in two people and say, are they siblings? And you need names for these two variables. I don't know what some good variable names are. Just person one, person two. Yeah. Sometimes I, um, you know, I like using names suggestive if the query turns out to be true. So I might use bro and sis. That's maybe too specific to make us feel like two brothers would not be siblings, but.
but uh, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll call it P1 and P2. Of person one, person two. Okay, uh, so siblings of person one, person two, if parent of X and person one and parent of X, if they have the same parent, I like that. Remember that a variable needs, needs to start with an uppercase letter. And realize that chat windows will change substitution and do auto substitute on stuff you write as code. But uh, yeah, so parent of X, oops, X and P2. So we want the same X to be the parent of P1 and P2. So let's go ahead and try that. I think I'm going to be happy with this, but uh, it may not be quite what we expect. Okay, siblings of, well, let's just try it. Siblings of Bart and Lisa. True, woohoo. And uh, it comes, actually says true twice. Why does it say true twice? Because they share both of the same parents? Yeah, exactly. So, or I'll, I'll say the same thing in a different way. Oh, I have not been using that. My headset. <laughs> I've been wearing it's my true head. once for each parent that they share. Exactly. There are two solutions to X. X could be Marge or X could be Homer. Those are both solutions. And so it sort of found both solutions. Now here I wasn't asking for that, but it searches. It Prolog always searches for all solutions. Um, even down at, even if the top level query comes up, being just okay. Is this a good test here? No, because if I could have had, is this a good unit test? Is all the tests I need? No, because if somebody had code that said everybody were siblings, then it wouldn't work. So we need to try something with people who aren't siblings. So we'll go ahead and use uh, Marge and Lisa. And that comes back and says false. Okay. Um, and we can try some other combinations. Okay, so I think that that seems okay. Um, but let's go ahead and let's try uh, Marge and X. Let's find all the sisters of Marge. So I think there was somebody uh, who's Marge's sister. Oh, maybe, oh, Marge's sister is in the tree. She does have, oh, Selma and I'd forgotten, Patty and Selma. <laughs> Those are her sisters. Um, but they're not in this this file here. So let me go back to uh, siblings of, let's just go to siblings of Lisa. Okay. So how many siblings does Lisa have? Uh, Bart, yep. And Maggie and Lisa. And by the way, they come up, you get the same answers twice again, because there are two reasons why Lisa and Bart are siblings. One reason is the father, one reason is the mother. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, siblings of Lisa X, what we got Lisa. Now that's not usually what we mean, right? When you, in English, if say two people are siblings, you don't mean themselves. Uh, so really what could we do? We could go ahead and add here another constrict, uh, restriction. P1 has to be not equal to P2. So there is that we can add. And now if we go ahead and say, we get Bart and Maggie and Bart and Maggie, but we don't have Lisa being her. So th that's all fine and well. Um, really what I want to define, or it will come back to this, but what I really want to find is siblings or closer in the same generation where I'm most closely related to myself. Um, and I'm fairly related to my sister. Uh, but not as much as I'm related to myself. In, uh, in biology, right, in genealogy, they, they often look about two individuals, what fraction of their genes do they have in common? You have 50% uh, of genes in common with a parent. You have what, one quarter with a sibling or one half? One half, I guess. Um, if, if, if both parents are the same, if it's a steps, sibling would be one quarter. So yeah, so, uh, and how much DNA do you have in common with yourself? 100%. So for the biologists, or if you're a clone, so for the biologists, they definitely want to say, hey, what is the you know percentage? They want to say that, yeah, siblings or closer, you yourself are closer, more closely related to yourself than you are to a sibling or to anybody else. Okay. Anyway, uh, we could put that there or we can leave it off if we sort of say, hey, what we're calculating is siblings or closer. 
something along those lines, but in the same generation. Okay, um, first cousin, go ahead and write me a query first cousin. So use P1 and P2 for all of these. And for the, for this, don't worry about somebody being them, you know, uh, themselves or something like that. Uh, we'll we'll let that go. Definition of siblings: two people that have a parent in common. Definition of first cousin: two people that have a. So I think we go parent of we need to look at the parents of these. What should I call the parent of person one? P1 parent. And P2 parent. We want uh Hey, we need to figure out who their parents are, or a parent of each, and then sort of say, hey, your first cousins, if uh, P1 parent and P2 parent have the same parent, okay? Uh, parent of X and this is a grandparent. X is going to be a grandparent here. Uh, parent of X, the same parent person is the parent of P1's parents and P2's parents. Like that. Okay. Yeah, I think this will go ahead and just give us what we want. Let's give it a try. First cousins of Lisa, I'll just look for all first cousins of Lisa. Is that, do we have enough generations to get? No, we don't really have any siblings of, so I did put in a, some children. I, I made up children for Lisa. So I have a Lisa Jr. and a Bart Jr. So yeah, who are the first cousins of Lisa Jr.? Oops, first cousins does not exist. First cousin of there. Okay, Bart Jr. is, yeah, that's the solution. Uh, Bart Jr. is a solution for another reason. I think there's gonna be because there's two different grandparents. Kawabunga, that was another child I have for Bart that I made up. Um, Lisa Jr. is a first cousin of Lisa Jr. Oh yeah, okay, we're, we're sort of running into that same problem. Um, and now let me just do one more thing. Let me go look at Bart Jr. This is maybe what I should have done run this here. So who are the cousins of Bart Jr., first cousins? Well, Bart Jr. himself, and we're hopefully we'll get Lisa Jr. here. We're also going to get one more thing that we don't want, which is Kawabunga, which is Bart Jr.'s brother. Oh, yeah. Uh, this here was really saying, do you share a common grandparent? And yeah, you share a common grandparent with your, you and yourself and both share a common grandparent. You and your sibling both share a common grandparent and you and a first cousin share. So we could put in these not equal twos. I'm gonna end up uh, maybe taking them out. But yeah, for sibling, first cousin, we could go ahead and do all these things here. Um, and I could put in the exclusions that one person can't be, the person one's parent can't be the same as person two parents if they're first cousins. I'm gonna go for the rest of this lecture. I'm gonna interpret things like siblings and first cousin, meaning uh, first cousin or closer within that same generation. Okay, just, to, just so we don't have to worry about this thing here. Um, okay, and again, you know, biologically, if you're looking at behavior and wanna know, hey, these two individuals, how closely related are they? Are they this close or closer? That's often a, an actual point of interest. Okay. Um, yeah, can 
by the way, could we go ahead? There's a couple of ways we could write this. I think we could do that. If we if we did have siblings written, this actually was already what I had for siblings, right? So I could have said, hey, P1 parent and P2 parent have to be siblings. Okay. So that would I could have either way, these two are equivalent. I'm just in some sense, if I hadn't written siblings before, I would probably write this. If I had siblings, I could say, yeah, I can use that as a helper function. Both are fine. In fact, I might even, if I hadn't written siblings yet and I was asked to write first cousin, I might go ahead and write this and then say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and call my function siblings, my predicate siblings that I haven't written yet, but I'm going to, I am going think I can write that in a moment. Um, again, that's the method of wishful thinking, right? You, you're writing some code and you're like, hey, I'm going to call the helper function such and such right here, even though that helper function doesn't exist yet. Um, and then you could go go back and write the helper function. Okay, go ahead and give me. Uh, oh, um, could we write this in terms of grandparent? Yeah, I think we could end up writing first cousin of P one and P two if, since we had grandparent written up here. If there's somebody X who X is a grandparent of person one and X is a grandparent of person two, that would also be a way of writing it. So yeah, there can be de many different ways of doing it. These are all equivalent definitions. In fact, if you look in different dictionaries uh, of definition of first cousin, you might find any of these, these three prologues, I'll, I'll bet. Mathematicians would say they're equivalent definitions. Um, so how do we that simply do? We could say grandparent of X and P1. Uh, these these are all the same if we're not worrying about if we're saying first cousin or closer within the same generation. Okay, how about uh, second cousin or third cousin? Let me put that here. What is the second cousin? That's the first question. Ah, okay. If you have, and and we won't write. I won't go and write this, but you can imagine how you would. Uh, if you, what are second cousins? Uh, if, so I, I have a cousin, okay. Um, or should I think about my kid? No, I'll do this in terms of me, okay. So I have a cousin, somebody who I have a, a grandparent with, okay, my cousin Mary. Uh, and so uh, my kids and Mary's kids are second cousins. So my son and my cousin's son. Uh, are second cousins. Okay, so what is second cousin? Second cousin means your parents were first cousins. And what does third cousin mean? It means your parents were second cousins. Okay, and so on. So that's the nth cousin in general is, hey, uh, and so we're thinking of it this way, I, I have, you know, third cousins, hey, their parents are second cousins. Second cousins, their parents are first cousins. If you have two first cousins, their parents are well, siblings, but but I'm counting three, two, one. You know, first cousin, third cousin, second cousin, first cousin, sibling, sibling. You know, a sibling can be thought of as a zeroth cousin. Yeah. So uh, we don't usually use that term in in English, but yeah, zeroth. Hey, I'm zeroth cousins with my sibling. Now wait a minute. Uh, that, what if you go up a generation for siblings? You reach the common parent, right? How is that person related to themselves? I guess three, two, one, zero. Oh, that's negative one. Barland would say, hey, everybody is their own negative first cousin. It's trivially, just like everybody's their own ancestor, everybody's their own negative first cousin. Now that's weird, negative one. And here's where I will sit back and sort of say, this is again, just witness Barland's uh, weird brain, maybe, I don't know. In my quest to simplify things, I would say, hey, uh, negative one, that, that's wrong. You should be zero related to yourself. And with, you know, really, rather than uh, negative first cousin, a zeroth cousin, first cousin, we should have called them that, that one layer. That was sibling, right? So we really should say zeroth sibling, siblings, second siblings, third siblings, fourth siblings. So first cousins should really be called second siblings in Barlow's book. If I 
had to remake the universe, I would just change language so they use that term instead. So um, anyway, by the way, if you're curious about there's nth cousins and then what else related to that? You hear about like second cousin once removed. What does that mean? Oh, that means if I, two people are second cousins, if you can go up three generations to find a common ancestor, three or four, whatever. Um, second cousins. If two people are second, if two people are second cousins and one of them has a kid, this kid and that person are second cousins once removed. You are one step away from being second cousins. So that's the difference between uh, you know, second cousin and first cousin once removed or something like that. It's your one generation off from being the whatever cousin. So okay. Enough genealogy. Let's get back to let's get back to prologue. Um, let's go ahead and write uh, so we can write uh, sibling, zeroth cousin. We can write first cousin, second cousin, third cousin. I want to write a generalized nth cousin. Or in Barlow's terms, and sibling. Okay, that are two people of the same generation. Uh, do you have two people who are cousins? That, that is, you can go back the same number of steps from each one and find a common ancestor. Maybe it's seventeen. Two people. Hey, there's two people. If you go back seventeen steps, uh, you can find a one common ancestor. That'd be eighteenth cousins or whatever. So they're going to be nth cousins. Okay. So how would you write that? We wrote first cousin, I could write second cousin, I could write third cousin, I could write fourth cousin. Uh, again, that's going to give me a, I could write that program, but it would take me infinitely long to write it, and it could not fit into the memory of any computer, so I'm not really going to call that a valid program. Uh, we don't like infinitely large programs. So here we did that. Okay. Oh, so yeah, here, here's a second cousin and a third cousin written there. Take that away. Let me put this up here. Let's put this up in the right place next to the comments. Okay. Okay, so nth cousin. And now again, what a lot of people do when you come to this, you want to say, hey, nth cousin of A, so nth cousin of A B, if nth cousin of A B b if a's parent and b's parent are themselves nth cousins and so again it feels like you want to say this in your traditional uh programming languages but we can't because you know parent of a doesn't return first of all a parent takes two inputs and even if it did even if there is a, a single i guess we did have a no if we even if we did have a parent of one argument it would return a boolean and so you, you want to say you know, nth cousin of true false. There's, you know, there don't, no nth cousin has more than four possible inputs has uh, n squared inputs. Okay. Um, okay, nth cousin of a, b. How do we do that? They have the same parent. So our a's and b's, a's parent and b's parent are both themselves nth cousin. How do we write that? The recursive rule. By the way, can I make the base case? My base case is going to be A equal B. So Everybody is their own nth cousin trivially. Now, see if we can go ahead and come up with a recursive predicate. A's parent and B's parent are themselves nth cousins. Hint, give a name to A's parent like AP and B's parent, BP. How do we give the, again, part of me wants to say, oh, let AP equal parent of A, but that's not how prologue works. Ah, but this works. Hey, make up a new variable AP and prologue solve to make, make this true. Any way to make this part true, if I give you a person A, AP will be bound to a, a parent of, of A. And similarly, parent of, of B, B's, uh, BP is a parent of B and nth cousin 
of AP and BP. Okay, let's go ahead and test this one. We'll replace this first cousin with nth cousin. Well, first of all, we'll try Bart Jr. and Lisa Jr. Um, it doesn't say, oh, because oh, I spelled list junior. So why, yeah, why did that come back false? I misspelled Lisa junior. So list junior was some other atom, some other symbol that was not related to anybody. There was no mention of list junior anywhere in the database. So yeah, there was no way to make, make them related through a parent relation. In particular, just notice that that was, it did not give an error. Uh, we simply have the facts about, there's all the people, we only put in facts about the people. If there's somebody with no facts, you can imagine there's all the people with no facts are in our database. We just have zero lines to store the zero facts about them. Okay, so yeah, um, Bart Jr. and Lisa Jr. are cousins. And cousins for several different reasons, several different uh, number of grandparents, basically parents and grandparent combinations, including possibly themselves, so, because again, we're going to go ahead and in this formulation, I'm okay with the fact that um, somebody is nth cousins with themselves. Uh, I actually want that to help capture this, this thing uniformly. Um, okay, and we can go ahead and then say solve for X. Uh, nth cousin of Bart Jr. with X. Bart Jr., Bart Jr., Bart Jr., Bart Jr., Bart Jr. Cowabunga, so siblings with, sibling is there. Uh, Lisa Jr., okay, we got that, that's sort of what we really wanted, and then that was all, so. Okay, but that's our, our nth cousin. Okay, any other thoughts about that? Questions? Recursion in Prolog. I will put in one more, one more note here about this program. Um, so, what is this line? Look at line one hundred six here. This little base case rule. Nth cousin of a b if a is equal to b. Now, from Prolog's perspective, they don't care about the word nth cousin. They just say, "Hey, some predicate is true of a and b if a is equal to b." Okay. There's a shorter way of writing this. Okay. It's like, it's kind of like saying, hey, solve for all A and B such that A is equal to B. Well, that's any one value A is, and itself would be a. So, uh, you know, wherever you see A equal B, if you know that A is equal to B, why do you need two variables to hold them? If you know two things are equal, then, and this may be the first time we were actually asserted two things are equal, by the way. We had lots of not equals before. Here we have an equal. But if two things are equal, I'm going to get rid of that fact that A equals B. And I'm just going to say wherever B was being mentioned, I'm going to replace it with A. Nth cousin of A, A. And then separately, we saw last time, if you have a right-hand side with no facts at all, then we write, just put a, you don't even put that, need that thing there, just, it's a fact. And this is more idiomatic prologue. Nth cousin of A, A. Every, a is an nth cousin of themselves. Okay. And this runs just the same. We can go ahead and try rerunning it. We get the same, same values. Okay, so that's just a little thing to note if you're trying to write idiomatic prologue, uh, you can actually, uh, if two things are equal, you don't really need both variables. You can just, if you know they're equal, just use that other variable name. Okay, I'm gonna go and switch to talking about lists. And let me put a link into the chat window here just from the regular lectures. So if you go to our regular lectures page, homeworks, oops, not homeworks, uh, lectures. And there we go, lists in prologue. So I'm gonna go to this page here and show some things before we type in more stuff. Okay, or you can be looking at that page uh, on your own. So lists are in Prolog and they're they're built into Prolog. 
the syntax for list. They have a special, they say lists are such an important data structure about they're about the only, <laughs> and think about what data structures Prolog has. It doesn't really, you have variables, you have symbols and you have these relations. Um, relation is the closest thing you get to a data structure, but uh, yeah, but they do put in uh, lists into Prolog. And so while you're looking at that little page that I have on the screen here, you can pull that up here. Uh, these are all different ways of writing the same idea in Racket or Prolog. Um, da, 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 da. I want to go and pull up a, while you're looking at that on your screen, I'm going to go and look up. Oh, that was um, I'm going to go here and look for a file. And pull up a file that has a lot of these things in it. Um, Oh gosh, there's no scroll on this thing. I can only look at <laughs> relatively recent files. Okay. That's not quite what I wanted. Okay, I guess I'll have it. Typed in. Let's go ahead and make a, a new file, empty program. Okay. Um, so lists are in prologue. So now I'll go back to that racket window that you've been looking at. Okay. So yeah, we can go ahead and uh, you build lists by using the empty list and cons, okay? So Prolog uses square brackets for the empty list and it uses um, square brackets and a pipe symbol to mean cons. So um, cons of four, cons of five, cons of six empty, we'd write as bracket four, pipe, you know, pipe is cons. Four, cons, five, cons, you know, five cons down to a list, which is, and that list is six const on to this list, which is the empty list. Okay, so you can go ahead and write this in prolog and that's perfectly fine. Let me go to here. I can paste it in here and say, what do I get back? If I run this. Uh, interesting. I'll write it as this. I'll simply say, hey, solve for X equals that list four constant to five constant to six constant to the empty list and it'll come back and say x and this is uh if you just say four comma five comma six that is another way of writing the same list okay so uh you know like barland why didn't you just start with that because our code is really going to rely on the fact that lists have two fields a first and a rest and that is all they have there's nothing more to a list um and to process a list, you can only access the first of the list and the rest of the list and nothing else. Now, rest of the list might be another list that you handle, perhaps recursively, but that's its own thing. Okay, so we'll write it as four comma five comma six, but remember underneath that that's a cons, cons, cons going on. Okay. Um, and let me also write, so I could just write four comma five comma six. and run, okay. Um, I could also say, hey, four, let me get rid of the X equal, four comma five comma six is equal to something, I'll go ahead and call it F for first maybe, const on to the list five, six. Can you solve for F to make this a true formula? Yeah, I mean, four const on to the list five, six gives us, the list four, five, six. Okay, cool. So that makes sense. Um, you know, I can even go ahead and do this. 
Can I solve for f and r such that f constant to r is the list four, five, six? Well, yeah, there's only one solution. F has to be four and r has to be the list containing five and six. Um, can I go ahead and do something like this? F const onto the empty list gives me four, five, six. Nope, there is no way to solve for that. No solution. Okay. Um, how about this? Uh, X const onto Y const onto some other list. The rest of the rest, maybe. Can I solve for that? And I didn't mean to, but I have a typo in here, so it turns out I can't. I think, actually, that actually kind of depends. Let me try it. Cannot run query due to a syntax error. Syntax error, unexpected comma or, or bar in the rest of a list. Unexpected bar, and it's looking at this one right. Uh, it's OK here. X constant to something. But what does X need to be constant to? Eat, uh, one more thing, which is a list. And I'm, I have two things here. If I want to say, hey, Y constant to R as a list, I could say that. That's what I meant to say. Can I solve for this? Uh, X constant to a list containing Y constant to something. In fact, I'm going to name it underscore because I don't really care what the rest of the rest is. Yeah, I can go ahead and solve for that. X is four and Y is five. Okay. Um, and then just, uh, by the way, let me go and yes, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is kind of a way if I just want to pull, you know, I see what prologue is thinking, but I'm going to look at this and thinking, hey, if I have a list and I want to pull out the first two elements of a list, I'll just write this. Okay. Uh, use X and Y, and then boom, I now have local variables X and Y that are the first and the second item of a list. By the way, what if the list didn't have two items? Well, first of all, does this work? Yeah, that works. The, that other list that I named underscore because I'm saying I don't really care about it. Yeah, it would be the empty list. Yeah, but so certainly that works. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, but what about this? Can you solve for X and Y to make this true? No, there is no way you can solve. It doesn't matter what X and Y are. You can't say cons of X, cons of Y, and something is ever a list containing just four. So there is no solution. Okay, and then one last thing, and let's go back to the four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, yeah, I can go ahead and solve that. Uh, it turns out there's a, we sort of saw that this four, five, six, seven, eight is really shorthand for four constant to the list containing, five constant to the list containing, six constant to the list, blah, blah, blah. And, and the comma is a shorthand notation for that. Like that shorthand notation can extend to here. Okay. I'll go ahead and write this and get the same solution. Okay. So, and again, this is more convenient. There's still the constant going on. I still need this here. There's no way to do this with a comma and, and nothing else. Because if I just do this here, what are the solutions? Nothing. What if I go ahead and say, hey, comma z z z or comma underscore? And you're like, yeah, I, that X should be four, Y should be five, and underscore should be the list containing six, seven, eight. But that's not what comma means. Comma does not quite just mean cons onto a list. So this has no solutions. Why not? Because, well, imagine we just named this Z, Z, Z. Hey, I can't find three values, Z, X, Y, and Z, Z, Z. Even if Z, Z, Z were a list, this would be a list with exactly three items in the same way, this is a list with exactly five items. And a list with five items can never be equal to a list with three items. Doesn't matter what's in those lists. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and do that, the uh, going ahead and say something like, you know, several numbers, and then having a cons at the very end to catch everything else, that's fine. 
happens then. We still need to understand that constant going on, even if we're using the comma shorthand. Okay, so great. Uh, we saw some interesting things going on there. We can, we can do that. Um, what do I want to talk about next? How about, uh, by the way, do, 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 x comma y comma x. What is this going to, what are the different lists that can be equal to that? Well, this would be a list that contains at least three things, three or more things, and the first item and the third item have to be the same. So this, there are no answers. There's no way to solve for x, y to make that true. But if x was, if I had the list four, five, four, seven, eight, can I solve for x and y to make that true? Sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, we get sort of this pattern matching here. You know, you look at this and say, oh, it's a list with three or more items where the first is the same as the third. That's a very easy criterion to write in Prolog. Um, writing that in Java or in Racket would be, you'd have to take your list, pull it apart, assert that the first thing was equal to the first thing, assert that I had made sure you had at least three items before you try pulling those items out, et cetera. Um, okay, great. Now let's go and actually write some programs involving lists. That's what I want to go ahead and do. And so the first example that I have that's on the lecture page is what? Uh, just so we can follow along there. Do, do, do. Member, okay. Uh, is, uh, is one item a member of another list? So let's stay on this web page for a second here. Okay, so I want to write, remember, this is one of the first lists or first functions we wrote when you're processing lists in Racket. I think that contains 93 functions. Does it contain 93, which is again, you know, does it contain any one particular item? So, okay. Uh, yeah, so member of, is Sayonara a member of Hi, Bye, and Guten Tag? Uh, no, but is Hi a member of Hi, Bye, Guten Tag? Yeah. Is Hi a member of a list that contains Hi several times? That's another good test case to try. So these are all good test cases. I could also put in some empty lists and things like that as well. But this just gets us the idea of, hey, I'm gonna write this function member. Okay, how do we write this in Prolog? You might be able to, uh, and if you look in all the books, if you look in our textbook, they have this in there. And I think they just sort of say, here's how you write it in Prolog and boom, they give you the answer. I was like, well, how would you come up with that if you didn't already know the answer? So this is something you don't, I don't see written down very often. Uh, I'm going to give you a methodology for converting, for translating from a list processing code we know, how to get this answer by going through the list processing code that we know and love. Whether you write it in Racket or Java, I don't care. Um, but here's the thing. We still need to respect the design recipe or the, the data definition, rather. The data definition of a list is either empty or it's one thing constant to a list. We can't get rid of that. Okay, we still need to follow that logic. Uh, and so let's look at functions we've written like that. So uh, here is our racket code for does target occur inside items. And we had, uh, we had said, hey, list is either empty or constructed. Okay, if it's empty, I have an answer. If it's constructed, I have two fields, the first and the rest, okay. And if I have those two fields and uh, uh, pull out one of them, and one of them is itself another list, well, gosh, maybe making the naturally recursive call is going to be true here. All this is going to apply exactly in Prolog as well, because that, that's stuff about a list. That's nothing to do with any particular language. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and turn this code into Racket. By the way, if you're curious, I went ahead and just sort of remind ourselves that we can write the same code. We can write in Java as a static method. I could write it in Java using the fact that, hey, to represent, to say that empty and constructed lists are both types of list. I can do that if I have an abstract class list, just like we did with the y0.java or y0.java. Um, and then say empty extends list and const extends list. And now it's happy when you say that rest can hold any list now Java is happy because, oh, the rest field can be of type cons or of type empty, that union or 
that's how we get the union type. The type of that field has to be a union type, empty list or constructed list, which is why we needed these three named classes. Okay. Um, and in that case, the, I have the code split, the same code that I had before, the same things that were in the template up here. Uh, you know, here's that recursive call. Here's the first of the list. Combine them with an or and that. Yeah, that's the same thing we had checking for equality and an or and returning false. In the base case, all the green words, the green words are the things that are not in the template. They're not in the template. Here's where we add them in the racket. Here's where we add them in a static Java. Here's where we add those. Same. If you look at it, it's the same three green parts, just organized in different ways. Okay. Do um, you want higher order functions? Yeah, we can go ahead and call filter. Uh, things like that. Is, is it contained? I can call filter. Now I'm straying a little bit, but I still have that same logic of the, th the things that I need to do in green are still sort of sitting around there. And I ask here, I ask if it's a constructed list or not. That's a little bit differently. Uh, we didn't talk about fold, but we could do it with fold. Um, okay, here's how to do it in actual racket, which I'm not teaching you. I've not taught, taught you any racket besides uh, how to call a function and how to make a struct and how to uh, declare a variable. Stuff you learned in your Java 1 class all in the first week. That's uh, the only racket I've taught you. So, okay. Da -da -da -da. So let's go ahead and look at this code and say, I want to turn this code. I'll, I'll take this one here. Do you prefer the racket or the Java? I'll take either of these two. They're the same, so I don't care. I'll take the racket one just because I can fit it into the corner of the window and leave it large. So leave it there for reference pretty easily because it's only three lines. It's not spread across seven lines. It's spread only across three lines. That's purely an artifact of the spacing. That's, of course, it's the same code. Okay, now let me go and oh, pull this. Oh, I can pull this tab away. That's what I want to do. Wait, what? Uh, there we are. This is the one that was small. And let me, why did it change its scrolling when I ripped off the thing here? Da, 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 da. Here we are. I'll leave this up sitting up right up near the top of the screen. And then I'm going to go back to our prolog window. I just, I'm getting old. I can't, I can't rip off the tabs correctly. Okay. Let's go back to this prolog window and leave this small, make this one bigger. Okay. Let's go ahead and write that same program. Uh, so here's how I'm going to convert it to prolog. So define mem of talk. Uh, we'll see how we say and and how we say or. Um, if it's empty, the answer is false. Okay. Otherwise, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have this thing here. Um, so let, let me come back to the base case. That's it's a little bit weird. Let me look at this one here. We have an or going on and an equal. How do I do just this one here? I'm going to have mem of target items, and I want to capture uh, if the first uh, of the list, first element of the list is equal to target. So what, what am I going to write? Uh, mem of target items. I'm going to use the exact same variable names. Uh, just because I'm switching language doesn't mean I should change variable names. Uh, how would I say, first of all, how would I say that uh, targets equal to the first thing in items? So this is our first little glitch. Oh, I need to pull out the first item. I need to pull out the first from here. By the way, I'm going to assume that we already know where it counts. I'll come back to that, and I'll come back to this or. I'm just working on just the gray part of the moment. How do you pull out the first thing from a list? Oh, we saw that in the right-hand window down here. You know, we pulled out here. We pulled out three things from the list, x, y. You know, we, we pulled out x and y in the previous examples. Uh, I'll go ahead. Here's how I pull something out of a list. I say, hey, take f cons r and assert that that is equal to items. 
Now, again, if you solve to make this true, if you give me a list of items and you solve to make that true, F is the name of the first thing of the list. So there. This is, so what is this line here? This line here corresponds to checking of the equal to target of first items. And it's also the only way this can match also is if items were a constructed list because we have this part here. If items were not a constructed list, uh, we wouldn't, that wouldn't work either. So we've sort of done this, we've sort of processed this code and this code in the line. How do we do the or? How do you write or in prologue? You are a hero uh, if you're a mutant ninja um, or if you are a Powerpuff Girl. We put those on separate lines, we made two different predicates. So how we're going to do this, we're going to say, hey, again, I have to be a cons. I'm going to pull out the first and the rest because I want to do that. And now I want to say that, hey, the other part of the or was member of target and rest of items. Mem of target and woo. I named that rest R. These two lines here are exactly these two lines of the racket code. They accomplish exactly the same thing. You return true if you're a cons and target is equal to first, or you're a cons and member of target R, member of target rest of items. Okay, cool. What about this? We need this. We need code that corresponds to this, right? Mem of target items. How do I say this? Uh, how do I say that items is empty? Okay. Uh, and false. So. I'm going to point out, by the way, this rule is kind of weird. We're going to actually find out a, a pointless rule in prologue, unlike racket and racket, we needed this code. But it's going to end up uh, being a useless base case. Uh, why? Because in prologue, in some sense, things being false, you never need to write that down. Prologue assumes things are false if it can't assume them, if it can't show they're true. So, OK, but let's see if this works. Let's go ahead and actually try it. Let's try running this um, mem of target, um, sayonara, what were our test cases we had, and the list of hi, bye, and guten talk. Um, and we wanted those to be, there we are, and this should be false. That was our first test case. So some things about singleton variables, and we'll get rid of those, don't worry. Um, but yeah, okay, it came back with false like I expected. And then what about, uh, not, but if I try high in here, that was our second test case. And it comes back as true, okay? And if I ask it for more answers, it says false, there are no more answers, okay? Um, and then we also tried a longer list that contained high several times, or let's put by in there, something that's in the middle of the list. Yeah, even if it's in the middle of the list, even if it's near the end of the list, comes back true. It's recurring down in here. If you think about how this code works, it goes and recurs. Okay, so this code does seem to work, and we can try it with multiple occurrences, but it, it works just fine. Okay, let's get rid of. Um, so first of all, are we questions on that? How do what's the best way to get rid of? So I'm going to get rid of all these errors. Oh, yeah, I just close them here. Questions about how this code corresponds to here. So again, if you go look at the book, they'll just sort of jump to this, this code down here. In fact, they're going to jump to this code after we do some little post-processing that we're about to do. So I think the book is a little bit unhelpful that it doesn't really show you how to solve problems. It just sort of gives you five examples and then says, see? Yeah. But here we have something where we actually say, hey, let's take this natural data definition of a list, think about how we'd write it in Java or in Racket, and then convert that step by step. And, and that is done. Okay, so now 
we have some different things going on. One of them was the singleton variables. So I ran this, it said there was a singleton variable going on here. Can you find the singleton variable? What variable in there is something that's named and then never otherwise used? Is it R on client three? Yeah, so R is never used. So what do we do with singleton variables? Say, hey, don't bother naming it. And there was a singleton variable on this line. It was F. On this line, I didn't you know, only use F, okay. And now I think we're a little bit better. Um, let's try that. Still didn't like the single very, oh, I never used target on this line. Yeah, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so now, yeah, same program. We just sort of, any variables only used once. We said, don't bother giving it a name. And here's how I'd read this as a prologger. Hey, mem of anything items, well, if items is empty, then it's false. Doesn't matter, you know, just a mem of anything. I don't care. Similarly, uh, mem of target items, well, that's, uh, that holds if items is equal to f const on to anything and target is equal to f. This one here, uh, mem of target items is true if items is something const on to r and mem of target r. Okay, so great. That's one step, we've gotten rid of the singleton variables. We're gonna do one more uh, converting this to more idiomatic prolog. Every time we see an equal sign, if we have a variable equal to something, we don't need that variable, just use that something, okay? So let's start with, um, let's start with the first line. Items is equal to the empty list. Hey, why even bother naming items? Put that there. And now the prologue reads this as mem of anything in the empty list is false. Oh yeah, that actually that's actually easier to not bother naming that variable. It makes it read more easily. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Let's look at, and so again, the book just sort of jumps to that and it's a little bit weird if you're not used to it. Okay. Um, any equal signs going on in line four? Let's look at that one next. Yeah, items is a list of something constant to R. Well, let me get rid of that criterion. Wherever I see items, I'm just gonna replace it with something constant to R. In fact, let me do a, get rid of that and then cut. And here I mentioned items. There we are. Let's read this line like a prologger. Mem of target, so, so is a member of target of a list of something constant to R? Well, that's true. if mem is the target of r. Sorry, if me, if target is a member of r. So is target a member of something constant to r? Yeah, if target is a member of r. Yeah, that reads again, wow, this is this actually reads much cleaner. I like this better. There's less verbiage going on here than all these extra words we had for the the racket. And if you thought this was a lot of words in racket, yeah, go look at the java <laughs> solutions we had. So yeah, this is kind of cool. This is very clean. This is like a surgical knife. I'm getting to like this prologue. It, it looks cool. It's a weird way of thinking, but man, it's coming out well. Um, okay, go yourself. See if you can take this line in your own notes and get rid of all the equal signs. Start with the target equal F. I don't need to say the target is equal to first. I'll just go ahead and um, I'll get rid of F and wherever I had F, I'll just replace it with target. Right here. Let's see if you can take it the next step as well. Here's items. Um, hey, I don't need the variable items, just wherever I have used items before, replace it. Let me do a cut. And yeah, wherever it items. And by the way, if I have a right-hand side with nothing in it, I can just say, say that. It's automatically true. It's kind of like saying true is over on the right-hand side. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Let me make one more change. Well. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and observe that 
Uh, it's maybe a little bit misleading here. In most languages, you have to explicitly return false. Again, in Prolog, if something is false, you never need to tell it it's false. It assumes everything is false unless it can prove it is true. So we don't actually need this one. We can get rid of it entirely. Boom. This is Prolog dropping the mic on us. Hey, how does a member work? Target is the member of a list. Target is a member of a list that is target constant to anything. Yep. Target is a member of something constant to R if target is a member of R. We'll leave the stage. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That is sharp. Oh, come on. Just warms my heart here. Okay. So that's um, uh, prologue where we did some list processing. And how did we go about doing it? Start with any code, any language that respects the data definition of a list of uh, either being empty or concept first and rest. Okay. Um, once you have that code, then you can sort of translate it bit by bit to prologue and get something that works just fine. And then once you have that, then you can go ahead and get rid of your singleton variables, get rid of equal signs, and just really tighten up your, your prologue code. And we can run it here, and all this still runs just the same. OK. What's the next example we have in the notes? Time for one more example? Yeah, that was so exciting. You want to do it again? Let's get on the roller coaster again. Awesome. OK. I hear you. I'm with you. Um, da, 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 da. So again, these all these steps here are in the notes, step by step by step, ending up with this version here. OK. So did, oh, yeah, I guess we can look at some of the ways we can call mem. So right in, pro, in regular languages, hey, is one element a member of a list? OK. But you know, now that we can do the solve for x, we get some different things in here. Solve for x, such that member of x with this list. Oh, and that sort of goes through and gives me the individual items of a list, except, ooh, we're getting high, high, high over and over and over again. Why is that? Um, yeah, that's not what I wanted. And I should say there's one thing and uh, yeah, so next, oh, there. I don't know what was going on there. Closing everything, fixed it. Um, okay, yeah, hi by talk. Okay, so yeah, mem of x with that. So we actually got an iterator. We not only do we get a member function that returns true or false, we also sort of got an iterator for the list, for, kind of for free, because of if we are thinking about this. How about hi and um, Let me go ahead and say, open sayonara. Yeah, I can have something like this here. Hey, x equals sayonara is one solution, and that's. Uh, doo -doo. Oh, oh, I know what was happening. Why well, I was giving you the same answer? I was pressing run repeatedly. I wasn't pressing the next button. Oh my goodness! It's definitely a Monday today, even if it's on Thursday. Okay. Yeah, so we can do this. How about hi const on to some other list z? Are there any solutions for z that will do this? Are there any list z that will make this true? Yeah, there are. There is, actually, it's kind of interesting. Sayonara const on to anything. And they just sort of say, oh, interesting. Here are all the solutions. Sayonara constant to any other thing at all. Okay. Or anything at all constant to sayonara. Con uh, sorry, any anything at all followed by sayonara constant to a different anything at all. And so on. Um, man, there's a bunch of the here. These are all the possible lists that can contain sayonara. Yeah. And of course, you'd, even if you just were to list, the individual 
numbers that could come before the sayonara there, the underscore 1392. Of course, that would take you forever, which is why they say underscore, hey, anything, you know, anything at all. Uh, okay. So that's kind of interesting. We actually got uh, several different functions going on here. So I'll finish up three minutes. Um, we won't write append. We could. Maybe we'll write it at the beginning of next time. Um, but imagine if you had a, had a function append. Now, the problem with append is, unlike mem, mem already in racket returned a Boolean. So it was a really good mesh for, for prolog. Um, but append doesn't return in, in racket or in Java, append doesn't return a Boolean. It returns a whole new list. So we can't say, hey, append of this list and this list is either true or false. It's just sort of there. How do we fix that? We make uh, a version of append that has three inputs and says yes or no. If I append the first two, do I get the third? OK. So here's an example of a couple examples. Hey, if I append the list high there with the list every body, do I get this list here? Yeah. If I call those append and I get this, do I get this list here? No, I don't. OK. So that's append. How do you actually call that in real life if you have append? And it's a, do we have append? I think append is built in, so we should have it here. Append of hi there, the list every body, and the list hi there every body. So is append built in? Yeah, append is built in. And it comes back as true. But you're like, well, this is kind of boring. But how do we actually use it in Prolog? Something like this. Hey, you want to append two lists? Great. Call them, give them to append, and put Z. And we'll think of Z as being an out parameter, if you will. We get, we get this here. So OK. So that's how you go ahead and can take a function that doesn't return a Boolean. If you have a function that doesn't return a Boolean, wants to return another thing, you can think of it as saying, hey, add that third thing as an out parameter. OK. That's one way to think of it. Now, Prolog doesn't think in terms of out parameters. OK. Um, it thinks in terms of solving. And it has no idea that uh, when we wrote append, uh, which we could write ourselves easily, uh, that there were three parameters to append, and it didn't make any distinction among them at all. In particular, let me go back and look at the thing we had up here. Copy and paste. So this will be our neat thought for the weekend that I'll leave you with. Hey, append of high there with the list y, does that equal the list high there, everybody? Ah, hey. Oops. We get the list, everybody. OK. So what is this? This is the function. It's not really the function of append. This is actually the function remove prefix. Hey, give me a big long list and give me the prefix to remove and solve for the things that I would go and need to stick in there. OK. Um, by the way, does that sound familiar? We can go ahead and so solve for is one thing a prefix of another by saying, hey, uh, just call append. Something append, this appended to something would give that. Hey, that's I had you write that has prefix in one of the first homeworks, right? And it wasn't using lists, it was using strings, and you did a substring. Um, and you had to worry about indices being right. And a lot of people sort of missed it if the second thing was too long because you called substring. Yeah, because you had to sit down and specify the algorithm to find the answer. Declarative programming, you simply say, hey, what does it mean for one thing to be the prefix of the other? And I had a little footnote. What does it mean for one string to be a footnote of a uh, prefix of another? If there's some string x that's string appending, your, the, the first argument to x gives the other argument. Yeah, that is what Prolog is saying right here. And this becomes that little footnote that I said, hey, what exactly do I mean by appending? Here's what I really mean by, or has a prefix. Here's what I mean by has a prefix. That is my Prolog code. 
that is my prologue code. Saying what the answer really is, is the prologue code. Yeah, that's what it means to be a declarative language. So I'll leave you with that thought. Actually, I'll leave you with, you might be having one other thought. Um, what about this? What is, what's the solution to this? What is an X and a Y that makes this true? Oh, X could be the empty list and Y could be the whole list. Or X could be the list containing one item and the other three. Hey, this function append was more than just appending. It not only was appending, it was a has prefix. It can also be a has suffix. I think you can realize that. And it could be, hey, find all the ways to split a list. I'm getting four for one here with my prolog function. And I don't get that with my racket or my job or anything else. Yeah, this is a very different way of thinking, but is pretty dang cool too. So, okay. I'll leave you with that. And again, this is all at the bottom of the notes page already. So you can ponder it there. And I'll stay on for office hours. Otherwise, I will see people next week. Uh, any questions on the discussion board? This, the, the current homework, not too bad, but need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and I, the other thing I'll say about the homework, about the functions and the function apply, that is exactly as difficult as let okay you're doing the same thing that you're doing in let so all the ideas if you understand exactly and deeply how let works especially let with shadowing of it when, after you do the first part then you'll understand the function application and the function application with, with proper shadowing um, in the second part so okay great i will see you on tuesday have a good weekend you too.